Greetings to everyone from around the world. This is a Sunday sermon recording from Father Mike of Our Lady of the Hills Parish here in Southwest Ohio. I am your host, Ishmael Ali, and here is Father Mike's sermon. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Reading of the Holy Gospel according to John. As Jesus passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. He spat on the ground, made clay with the saliva, and smeared the clay on his eyes and said to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. So he went, and he washed, and came back able to see. His neighbors and those who had seen him earlier as a beggar said, Isn't this the one who used to sit and beg? Some said, It is. But others said, No, he just looks like him. He said, I am. They brought the one who was once blind to the Pharisees. Now Jesus had made clay and opened his eyes on a Sabbath. So then the Pharisees also asked him how he was able to see. He said to them, he put clay on my eyes and I washed, now I could see. So some of the Pharisees said, this man's not from God. He does not keep the Sabbath. Others said, how can a sinful man do such signs? And there was a division among them. So they said to the blind man again, what do you have to say about him since he opened your eyes? He said, he's a prophet. They answered and said to him, you were born totally in sin and you're trying to teach us? And they threw him out. When Jesus heard that they had thrown him out, he found him and said, do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered and said, who, who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, oh, you have seen him, and the one speaking with you now is he. He said, I do believe, Lord, and he worshiped Jesus. The Gospel of the Lord. I read the short version today because the sermon's a little long, so we'll try to equal it out here. Lent 1977 in April, or I guess March or April, <coughs> irrevocably changed my life forever. I was watching on TV the miniseries, Jesus of Nazareth. Has anyone ever, have you ever saw this? Yeah. Did you watch it live 50 years? Oh, you weren't born 50 years ago. So you wouldn't know. You probably saw it on the internet. But isn't it great that Jesus of Nazareth is really great? And there's this one scene, okay? There's one scene where the Roman soldiers, they came through a Jewish town. They were killing and they were stealing. And a Jewish man throws himself down on the dirty street. And he's crying out to God, how long, O oh Lord, must we wait for you to help us? God has abandoned us. How long, O oh Lord? And the distraught man on the street, he keeps saying over and over, how long, O oh Lord? And then the camera zooms in to a little boy who's standing only 10 feet away, and that little boy was Jesus. Remember that, Joyce? Well, anyways, that's what happened. The little boy is Jesus. <clears throat> the man's answer to his prayers was only 10 feet away, but he couldn't see it. He couldn't see it. The Messiah that he wanted was like a king and big army and swords and clubs. But Jesus came as a, uh, as, a, as a savior, a Messiah as a savior. 
four years of my life, I, I felt that man's pain. Because for four years of my life, I was pleading to God. I was asking God, give me an answer to my life's, to my life's question. And the question was this, do I return to the seminary and finish my studies for priesthood and become a priest, or should I stay in the world and be normal, get married, 2.5 kids, have a nice house, you know? And Lord, what do you want me to do? For four years, I really was unsure. And so I prayed to God. And then God spoke to me through that scene that I just told you. Like the man could not see God's answer that was standing right in front of him. The answer to my prayer was there all along. I just didn't want to see it. You know, the, the false joys of this world blinded me from seeing the chosen path that God had gave to me. I didn't want God to change my life, really. At that time, life was good. I was the assistant sales office manager at Paul Smith Company. They were grooming me to be the sales office manager. Guess what I sold? Parts for old radios and TVs. <laughs> My first love of radio started right there. We sold little coils for, for the uh, radios and televisions. And, and I was making, in 1975, I was making a whopping $10,000 a year. That's a lot of money back then. It was like about 40 grand, wasn't it? I mean, baby, I had it all. I had bling bling. Eyes at Lacoste clothes. <laughs> and I was making good money. And, you know, I worked in a factory that made these coils. And the only ones, Tom, that they hired were young women. 100 young women were in that factory because their hands were little and they could wind the coils. I could have got any girl I want. Back then, I was good looking. Called me Mr. Gigolo. <laughs> yeah, that's right, I laughed too. I ain't that way now. <laughs> so, I mean, this is heaven on earth for, for a bachelor, you know? And everything was really good. And I didn't want God to mess up my life. I was comfortable right where I was at. But I did say yes to God. Like Mary, I said, okay, God, yes. I, I'll do you, what you want me to do. And you know what? Blessings came to me that I could never have dreamed of if I got married and had 2.5 kids. I've had such wonderful blessing. And right now, I could see clearly the true treasure of my heart's desire and that's to give myself in service and to listen to God and try to do what he wants me to do he opened up for me a new world where he gave me blessings so many and you are one of the blessings being pastor that's a great blessing it really is and uh, in two years I'll be your longest serving pastor. So just pray I live two more years. Okay, Linda, pray. Your prayers are pretty powerful. <laughs> two more years, and I hopefully, hopefully I will continue to enjoy the blessing of you, and I know I will. You know, it's ironic. When God spoke to me that night to go back to priesthood studies, he spoke to me through an old black and white TV that it had parts in it made by my company. Isn't that weird? It was a Philco 
We made parts for Philco televisions. It was a Philco. It was so ironic. God spoke to me through my handiwork. The miniseries about Jesus showed the healing of the man born blind, which gave me a new understanding of the greatness of this miracle. The blind man, you see, he sits all day begging, and he yells out to the crowd, I was born blind. Help the poor blind man. May the Lord give you happiness. Please help the poor blind man. The blind man had it good. He really did. All he had to do, Joyce, was sit there all day, help the poor blind man, and everybody gave him money and food. His life was secure. He didn't have to work. He had no responsibilities. And he didn't miss his eyesight because he never had it. He didn't know what he was missing. So was he suffering? No. He lived off the kindness of others. Everything was given to him. Life was easy. Life was simple. Who would want to change that? Even some of the bystanders there. As a joke, they picked him up and he dragged him over to Jesus. And the blind man loudly protests, leave me alone, leave me alone. <clears throat> One bystander remarks, he does too well as a blind person. If he could see, no one would give him anything. <laughs> see, even they recognize what a cushy life he had. And even a disciple said to Jesus, Master, the man was born blind. Why change that? And Jesus replies, the man lives in darkness. He deserves to see the light. And then Jesus reaches down. He spits, spits on the ground, the dust. And with his spit, he makes mud to put on the guy's eyes. In Jewish belief, the spit of a firstborn son was believed to have healing power. Did you know that? Well, now you do. Because why did he spit? Why would they re record that, you know? It's kind of gross. But in his day, Jesus, it was healing medicine. And so he made the mud. And he starts to put it on the guy's eyes. And the blind man continues to loudly protest don't touch my eyes. You're hurting me. Don't touch my eyes. Then Jesus commands him to wash his eyes in the pool of Siloam. And the people, they carry the blind man. They carry him over. I always wondered, how did he get there? Now I know. They carried him. And they brought him to the pool. And the blind man washes and now he's healed, and he yells out, I could see, I could see all of you. I'm not blind anymore. The crowd is dumbfounded. And they take him back to Jesus, who reveals to the man, his eyes are now looking at the Messiah. And he worships Jesus. Jesus calls him from the old life of begging to a new life of believing. I made that sentence up myself. That's a good one. I should copyright that. The old life of begging, the simple, secure life of begging, where he didn't have any responsibility to grow or to become better. All he had to do was beg. But then when he had the new life of believing, Jesus would challenge him, challenge him to become a disciple. The legend has it that that blind man died a martyr, gave up his life as a martyr for Jesus. Not very cushy, is that? <laughs> but he did. And then the Pharisees, you know the Pharisees, they always mess things up. The Pharisees enter the scene, 
And they angrily accused the man of being a fraud and Jesus a sinner. The healing of the man born blind has given me a new spiritual understanding of my journey to God. God always calls you out of your old comfort zone. And God continually challenges you to grow in love, to grow in mercy, to be the best person for Jesus that you could be. Make no room for complacency in your soul. When I came here 19 years ago, I thought, ah, oh, this is a cushy job. I'm going to just retire here, you know, keep working and be like semi-retired. Then four years later, Father Frank dies. And then I get St. Benignus with our church here. And then I got cushy up there. Everything started to run, run real good, you know. Got a, a great crew, great staff. So I was ready to semi-retire again. And then the Lord says, you think you're out to lunch, Mike? No, you're back in business. Now we have the beacons of light. And I got four churches. Four of these things. Lord, what happened to my retirement? <laughs> but when he calls you, he gives you strength to do what he asks. Complacency. Make no room for it in your soul. It is a spiritual poison, and it will make you blind. What is complacency? How does it hurt you? Well, complacency is defined as a feeling of being satisfied with yourself so that you do not think any change is necessary. You know, don't change. Lord, keep things the way they are. I'm very comfortable. Don't change it. It hurts you by deceiving and deceiving you into thinking that you see, but you really don't see. It's smug satisfaction that I have all the answers to everything, that I am in control of my own life. No need to change that. And the evil fruit of complacency is pride. It's pride. You know, I'm the captain of my own ship. Don't tell me what to do. The Pharisees are the perfect example of this. They knew the law. They knew the law. And anyone who acted outside the law was a sinner. The Pharisees considered Jesus a sinner because he healed on, his, on a Sabbath. And not only that, but Jesus had another mortal sin. He needed, K-N-E-A-D-E-D. -E -E you know what that means, right, Joyce? To knead bread, to mix. Because remember, Jesus mixed his spit in the dust to make clay. That's called kneading. The Jewish law said, thou shalt not knead on a, on a Sabbath. And so Jesus had two mortal sins. He healed and he needed. And the Pharisees thought Jesus was a big sinner. The Sabbath law, Jesus violated. He violated the law. But you see, here's the problem. The Pharisees were so much into law, they couldn't see God's love in action. You know what we call that? <clears throat> grace. They couldn't see grace because they were so stuck on the law. They couldn't see God's law of love that supersedes all other laws. And in God's law of love, he brought healing to a man who felt probably unloved. I think there's a bit of Pharisee in all of us. There is. Even Baptists who become Catholics have some Pharisee. Let me tell you the four ways <coughs> that you can see if you're a Pharisee. And so here they are. <coughs> Excuse me. Number one, you look down on and judge others 
who do not consider whom you do not consider as pious and holy as you are you know <clears throat> that's never been my problem i'm not pious and don't expect me to be pious i don't want to be pious because i'm not worthy to be pious i'm just a sinner like everybody else and i'm still striving for holiness but sometimes people think they've already arrived and they're all pious and they're all holy and they judge others who they think are sinners and not pious like myself. Number two, you criticize others who do not think and act like you do. We think we do that all the time. Number three, I'm right and you're wrong. Don't tell me what to do. You know what we call that? Marriage. That's marriage right there. I'm right, you're wrong, don't tell me what to do. We do that with God too, you know? Number four, I'm really good at worshiping God on the outside, but not being Christ-like on the inside. You know, I put up the good pious front, but inside, I'm really not living the Christian life at all. It's called being a Christian non-Christian. And let me tell you, this is diverging a little. You know, in the Catholic Church, <clears throat> there is a division right now and there's a division between those who like the more traditional Mass, the Latin Mass, and those who like the new Mass, which is already 60 years old, called the Novus Ordo. And you see these fights going on. You know, I like the traditional Latin Mass. They speak Latin. Well, let me tell you, God doesn't care what language you worship him with. He don't care if you speak Latin. He don't care if you speak English. He just wants you to praise and worship him. He don't care about the language. He cares about the language of the heart. Speak to God with this lang language. Rend your heart, not your garments. Rend from your heart anything that's not of God. Selfishness, pride, envy, jealousy, <clears throat> you know, stinginess, inability to forgive, inability to love. Rend your heart of those things so that you could be healed and God's loving grace can fill you. And another thing too, are the veils, the veils. Women now are wearing veils at mass, some women. And that's become a bone of contention. And I think that's so stupid because it don't matter. God don't care if you wear a veil. Some veils are pretty nice. I like them. And God doesn't care if you don't wear a veil. That doesn't mean you're a sinner. You know, whether you wear a veil or not, God doesn't care. He does not care what's on top of your head. He cares what's inside of your head. You know? What did Jesus say in John chapter 4, verse 5? Love the Lord your God with what? All your mind. Your mind. So God don't care what's on top of your mind. As long as inside your mind, you're worshiping and God and doing his will. So there you go. Like the robes I wear here, they're real pretty, aren't they? They make my gray hair look good. But I tell you, I feel so unworthy to wear these. And I pray in my prayers. I say, God, you know, if I have to wear these holy robes, help me to be holy as you want me to be, to more worthily wear this robe. So I, I work on it. I haven't got it yet, but I'll get there. On my deathbed, <laughs> you know. My brothers and sisters, God saved his harshest condemnations for hypocrites. Don't be a hypocrite. Don't be a Christian non-Christian where you're all good on the outside, but inside you have evil thoughts and, and desires. And God defines hypocrisy in Luke chapter 6, verse 46. This is God. This is what he says. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? Doesn't that sound like a kid with a parent, you know? 
Oh, you're my mommy. You're my daddy. I ain't going to do it. No. <laughs> and we do that to God. You know, we don't do what he tells us. In closing, start your day with Psalm 25, verse 4. This is so beautiful. Here it is. Show me your ways, Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth. And teach me, for you are God my Savior, and my hope is in you all day long. Amen. God bless you. This recording of Father Mike's sermon was produced and edited by me, Ish Ali. The intro music is Amazing Grace, sung by LaGrave Avenue CRC of Grand Rapids, Michigan. Thank you to Father Mike for a great sermon. Previous recordings of Father Mike's sermons can be found at stmaryhillsborough.org. That's S-A-I-N-T, maryhillsborough.org, and on the St. Mary Hillsborough YouTube channel. If you enjoyed this program, please donate and help sponsor future sermon recordings. You can send checks to St. Mary Catholic Church, 212 South High Street, Hillsborough, Ohio, 45133. All donations are tax deductible and greatly appreciated. Thank you for listening.